introductions. It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. My question is for the Acting Premier. I had uh, the privilege I'm uh, very much aware of the happenings in the province, and I'm going to ask that we uh, spend a moment just to reflect on what my job is, and I would like to be able to provide all questioners and those giving answers with the appropriate attention that it does deserve. Leader. <clears throat> Center this past weekend in Ottawa, I was moved by the work they do. But the truth is, mental health care facilities in Ontario need the government's help. The geriatric hospital wing at the Royal has a three-month waiting list. Drug addiction services have an even longer waiting list. And I asked the staff, I asked the physicians at the Royal what we could do, what we could raise at Queen's Park, and they said, tell the government, tell the Minister of Health to stop Question. cutting our mental health facilities. Will the government commit to supporting mental health in the province of Ontario? Thank you. Health and Minister of Health, long-term care. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm hoping, based on that question, that the uh, the, the official opposition will support us in our budget because, in fact, we are increasing our fundings not ge just generally to hospitals, uh, an additional $345 million to hospitals, but specifically to our inpatient mental health hospitals across this province that we uh, have made a substantial new increase this year. Uh, and I would uh, hope that the, the member opposite would recognize that, that it's important for these hospitals in the context of the transformations that we're undergoing. They're moving uh, with us in terms of uh, reform to funding models, focusing more on uh, out outcomes and what truly benefits patients. We're also moving more and more of the patients uh, that we can uh, provide support to into the community where they can be best cared for. The evidence demonstrates the outcomes are better in the community, so we're making Thank these reforms you. with our hospitals, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker. You want to talk about outcomes? The outcome and the reality is the government's not doing enough. You know, there's not enough when mental illness affects one in three people during their lifetime. The funding is not enough when one in three hospitalizations are caused by mental illness. We know that 70% of mental health issues emerging are in the teen years. The government needs to make resources available for our youth. But this government has done the opposite. They have cut mental health. So my question to the acting premier or the minister of health is will you commit to stopping the cuts in our mental health facilities. Well, once again, Mr. Speaker, we're increasing our funding to mental health across yeah. this province. We're in the yeah. middle of a program, a new uh, expansion, $138 million new dollars, Mr. Speaker, in our mental health and addiction services in the most recent budget that's been yeah, tabled. We've it. increased specifically an allocation wholly dedicated to our mental health hospitals. The Royal, as well, has benefited from a substantial new investment in a dedicated CT scan, Mr. Speaker, that yeah. will benefit Very patients helpful. that have uh, are challenged Very by mental illness. Promise. So there are many, many things that we're doing to transform our mental health services across the province, including at the Royal in Ottawa. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, no one believes this government is doing enough on mental health. The reality is mental health is just as important as physical health. But this, this Premier, this government doesn't recognize how cruel it is that they go out during Bell Let's Talk Month and say, come forward, have the courage to ask for treatment, and then they cut that treatment. How hypocritical, how wrong. You want to talk? The, uh, the leader will withdraw. Withdraw. Beyond. The reality is, when you ask, when you actually go and visit these centres, when I visited Ontario Shores, they said the cuts were too much. They had to fire staff. At the Royal, Order. last year, they had to cut 18 staff members who are needed on the front lines of dealing with mental health in Ontario. Question. 18 people were cut. So the question is, I appreciate you've got your talking points, but every mental health facility is cutting Thank staff. You. It has to stop.
And if you continue, I'll have to deal with you. Now, I've already mentioned it once, I'll mention it a second time, and that'll be the end. While I'm trying to speak, and I'm standing, giving people instructions, the minute I sit down, I hear heckling, I'm going to go after those individuals. Number two, the member please address the chair. Minister. So, Mr. Speaker, it's right there. It's right there in the budget document on page 117, the important investments, the new investments that we're making in our mental health and addiction services, including in our hospitals. But I think, Mr. Speaker, it's important to also recognize that mental health is evolving in the sense that the outcomes. The member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke, the member from Leeds Granville. Carry on. So the finance minister has reminded me more than $16 million to mental health services, in addition to $138 million that we're investing also in community care, because I would hope that the leader of the, of the official opposition would recognize that we need to follow the evidence and the science and what best outcomes Answer. exist for those with mental health challenges, and often that's moving them into the community and providing supportive care, like the 1,000 new supportive wow. Thank you. Member from Lee's Grenville, second time. New question, the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, since I can't get a straight answer on why every mental health facility in Ontario has had to cut staff, let's, let's try something else. A recent forum poll had some interesting uh, information. It said that there is strong disapproval for the Liberal version of cap-and-trade. It said nearly 60 per cent of the people in Ontario disapprove of cap-and-trade as a cash grab. If you want to get public buy-in, if you Making references to you means that you're not speaking to me. I, I need to be included in this. Please, it helps. And as far as I'm concerned, if it continues on this side, I'm doing the same thing. Please finish. Mr. Speaker, if the government wants to get public buy-in for their environmental policies, it can't simply be a cash grab. It has to be revenue neutral. Will the government commit to making their cap and trade policy Question. revenue neutral? I missed it. I missed it. You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Speaker. And I do want to start by sincerely congratulating the leader of the opposition for his change of heart on the environment. Yeah. to see your position on that. The tricky part, though, is, Speaker, is this. There have been some flip-flops. Now he's supporting the environment, but for nine years, as a, as a member of the Harper Caucus, he sat on his head. No, you do. He sat on his hands when, when, when. Member from here on, Bruce. Please finish. Speaker, the now leader of the opposition sat on his hands when Harper withdrew from the Kyoto. Stop the clock. I, I'm, I'm going to take a position on this that I want to talk about government policy here. So if there are going to be responses in question, or questions that lead to that, I'm going to say fine. If it doesn't lead to that, talk about government policy, please. Thank you. So this is about policy because Canada's reputation was harmed. Um, I, stop the clock. I, I'm not going to debate this. Provincial government policy. So, speaker, now the leader of the opposition says that he believes that climate change is a major threat to Ontario, but when he ran for leadership not that long ago, he said it would not be my plan to bring in a cap-and-trade system or a carbon tax. 
Officer. Now, the PC leader says we have to do something about climate change, and that something includes putting a price Thank on you. carbon. Thank you. The supplementary. Mr. Speaker, my question was on revenue neutrality. I wasn't asking for smears or attacks or insults. This is a serious public policy question. The reality is this government's proposal will cause the average family in Ontario to pay $387 more. That's not right. This plan must include corresponding tax relief for individuals and businesses if you want to have the public's buy-in. So my question, Mr. Speaker, is the Liberals have to stop making life more expensive for everyone in Ontario. Why won't this government give families a break? Will you commit that this will not be a Liberal slush fund and that you'll give it back to the people of Ontario? You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Deputy Premier. So, Speaker, on Saturday, we were very When I get the attention, it's not the moment for you to then start interjecting. It's actually when you're supposed to stop. Finish, please. So the PC leader said on Saturday that there was practically universal support in the caucus for carbon pricing. But just last week, the environment critic said that it was PC policy not to support cap and trade. Premier, will you well said the, the member of the environment critic said, will you heed the advice of the PC party of Ontario and commit to not implementing a, a, a carbon tax? So, Speaker, it's pretty hard to tell the flips from the flops, but we're glad that you've decided. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the acting premier. Once again, I did not get an answer on revenue neutrality. You know, and let me say, our environment critic is a phenomenal MPP, and what she said last week was that we don't need a cap and trade policy. That's simply another liberal slush fund. So let me say this. Let me say this, Mr. Speaker, very clearly. This plan can't be another Colgate. It can't be another Metrolink slush fund. It can't be like the business grant program the Auditor General says was completely abused and not transparent. The money can't go to Liberal pet programs. A revenue-neutral plan must be subject to independent oversight. Will the government agree here today that it will not be another Liberal slush fund, it will be, it will be conditioned on oversight, and that the government will actually give it back to the Question. people of Ontario? Thank you. Yeah. You it, please. You it, please. Thank you. Deputy Premier. Uh, Minister of Environment and Climate Change. The Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Minister. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. You know, uh, there seems to be some big holes in the opposition's position. The first one is, Mr. Speaker, as you know, the financial accountability officer reported last week that by regulation, and I'll send it by the page over to the member of the official opposition, that this is a regulatory fee. This money can only legally be spent on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And it would be nice if the now that the leader of the opposition knows that, could be honest. But Mr. Speaker, I am curious. I am curious about did he tell people on Saturday that his tax would be $160 a ton, ten times what it would be under a cap and trade system? How did that answer play out with the people that he promised he would never introduce a carbon price tax to? Because a carbon tax doesn't have a cap rate. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Acting Premier. 
The Liberals are nearly doubling drug costs for most seniors. On top of that, on page 180 of the budget, uh, it says that the government's cutting $200 million from the Ontario drug benefit that helps seniors pay for their medication. Speaker, how much of that $200 million will be coming out of seniors' pockets? Thank you, Deputy, uh, Minister, Deputy Premier. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Health, long -term care. Mr. Speaker, we're proud of our drug program that provides nearly 5,000 different medications to Ontarians, including our seniors, but many others of low income that are deserving of those medicines. And Mr. Speaker, it is a program which we continue to invest in, about $150 million a year, or a 3% increase in that budget on an annual basis. We've made important changes, uh, measures in this budget, Mr. Speaker, so that an additional 170,000 people will go from paying $100 hundred dollars deductible to paying zero dollars deductible and that's mr. speaker that's an important measure that's going to benefit so many Ontarians it will bring to in that category almost 500,000 seniors who will not pay any annual deductible at all I would hope that that's something that the third party would appreciate yes, sir. provides support to those who truly need it Thank you. Well, Speaker, what the minister is not admitting to is that under the Liberals' plan, more seniors will be paying more for their prescription drugs. And on top of nearly doubling what most seniors will pay, the Liberals are cutting $200 million uh, from the seniors' drug uh, coverage. Now, why doesn't this government, Speaker, focus on expanding prescription drug coverage and protecting universal access to health care instead of cutting supports for Seniors. Mr. Speaker, we continue to increase our drug program, including for seniors, year after year after year. And I think it's important that the uh, that Ontarians understand that we have the most generous drug program for seniors in the entire country. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, it's true that the out-of-pocket expenses on average for a senior are approximately $277 in Ontario. The next closest province is approximately $600. Yeah. That includes provinces like Manitoba and Saskatchewan and Quebec, which are more than double the out-of-pocket expenses for seniors. So we have the most generous program. We, we need to make some changes in order to ensure the sustainability of the program. I believe that Ontarians appreciate that we should direct our greatest effort to those who need the Answer. help the most. Yep. That's what we're intending to do with That's this budget, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, not only are the Liberals planning to make seniors pay more for medication, their plan is to cut $200 million from the Ontario drug benefit, and that means less funding for seniors' medication. Why are the Liberals cutting $200 million and forcing seniors to pay more for their prescriptions instead of investing in, in expanding coverage so that more seniors have access to affordable medication? Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, we are continuing to increase our funding for drug programs, including for our seniors. What we're doing is we're shifting somewhat the responsibility for those seniors who can most afford it to help 170,000 more seniors pay no annual deductible. But it's not all we're doing for our seniors. We're also increasing our funding by $75 million for hospices and palliative and end-of-life care. We're adding the shingles vaccine, a free vaccine, an estimated $170 saving to each senior. We're removing the debt retirement charges, which will save our seniors, uh, on average, an additional $70 per year. We actually reduce the number of prescriptions that a pharmacist is allowed to charge for from up to monthly, up to 12, down to four. And that's yeah. going to save an enormous amount of money in the reduced yeah. co-payment costs for our seniors. And to to pharmacists less. That's right. Thank you. New question. My New question third part. also for the Acting Premier Speaker. It's been 12 days since the Premier announced her plan to nearly double the cost of medication for seniors in Ontario. It took her five days to realize that that was a mistake. Now she's giving herself until the end of March, Speaker, to figure out whether a senior making $19,500 a year is affluent. Has this Liberal government realized that their plan will nearly double medication costs for struggling seniors, or do they need 24 more days, Speaker, to figure out whether or not a senior earning $19,500 a year is actually affluent? Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, Speaker, I was I was a bit taken aback when uh, the deputy leader of the NDP announced that they would proudly vote against this budget, Speaker. What that means is that the NDP is voting against 
free tuition for low-income students, and reduce costs for middle-class families. Speaker. They're voting against the biggest infrastructure investment in Ontario's history that's going to create 110,000 jobs each year. Speaker. Uh, they're voting against increasing health care funding by $1 billion, including $345 million for hospital funding. They're voting against $178 million for affordable housing and homelessness initiatives. Speaker. They're voting against lowering hospital parking fees. They're voting against the Answer. vaccine. They're voting against 170,000 more Ontario seniors Thank you. getting zero deductible. Thank you. Supplementary. We will proudly be voting against a Liberal plan that will leave seniors paying more for their drug costs. The Premier has given herself, Speaker, uh, more than three weeks to figure out what everyone in Ontario already knows, that struggling seniors cannot afford to pay more for their medication. And on top of making seniors pay more, Speaker, the Liberals are planning to cut $200 million from the seniors' drug benefit. These are things that New Democrats don't support, Speaker. It should be no surprise to the Liberals that New Democrats actually believe in pharmacare and in more opportunity. Universality is what we believe in, Speaker. The Liberals have no such belief. Will this government stop cutting Question. and instead make medication more affordable for more seniors? Mr. Speaker, it seems to me that the only criticism the third party has of this budget is an item that the Premier has already said we're going to take another look at. So they're voting against making the shingles vaccine free for eligible seniors. They're voting against $100 million to help people reduce their home and energy bills. They're voting against eliminating the drive clean $30 fee. They're voting against reducing the auto insurance. They're voting against 250000 thousand four and five-year-olds having access to full-day kindergarten. They're voting against uh, supports to uh, uh, an innovative program for high school students to assist with financial literacy. They're voting against $75 million Answer. for hospice and community care. They're voting against, against $333 million to support Thank kids with autism. Thank you. Final supplementary. The acting uh, premier doesn't have to worry, Speaker. New Democrats will be talking quite a bit over the next number of days about all of the things in this budget that we have serious problems with. However, today I'm asking specifically about the fact that seniors have seen their drug costs uh, double. Seniors have also seen wait lists for long-term care speaker, get longer and longer. They're waiting months on months for home care. Speaker. If the acting premier wants a list, I'll give it to her. They're seen, they've seen physiotherapy services cut. Speaker. They're struggling to pay their heating bills. Speaker. And now the premier is increasing their medication costs and slashing the Ontario drug benefit. When will Ontario seniors get the respect that they deserve from this Liberal government? Thank you. Speaker, the, the, the NDP are saying that they are going to vote against $250 million more dollars to home and community care. Speaker, the NDP is saying they're voting against free tuition for the kids in the lowest um, in the lowest income. Actually, income up to fifty thousand dollars. Member from year. Hamilton East, Stony Creek. This is a life-changing initiative in this budget. The old NDP would have been standing up and cheering this new speaker, but the, N the new NDP is just uh, stuck on one issue that we've already said we will review. You know, there are other things in the budget, including go service to Niagara. Now, I am a bit surprised that the NDP would not be supporting go service to Niagara, considering that they've been big advocates of this speaker. There's a lot in this budget. Thank it's you. an important progressive budget. The Thank you. New question. The member from Nipissing. Thank you, and uh, good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. Minister, I have a document here that outlines an RFP issued by the LCBO on February 24th, one day before the budget was released. It states that the LCBO is seeking a real estate vendor to sell 
250 LCBO store locations right across the province. Wow. Section 3.2.1 states, quote, the LCBO's main intention is to sell properties. And 3.2.3 says the LCBO will consider Deputy leasing House out Leader, properties that are deemed unsaleable or if they can generate high revenue from a tenant. Speaker, can the minister tell us just how much money he expects this sale to bring in for the province, what will happen Question. to these LCBO locations, and how many jobs will be cut or otherwise the affected Beaches, as a result York. of the sale? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question for the member opposite, who I believe recognizes the tremendous contribution the LCBO provides our province by way of dividends. Recognizing that the expertise of the LCBO is operating a retail organization that has tremendous value, and we recognize uh, the work it does as a distributor for the benefit of Ontarians, who then realizes on some of those proceeds for hospital investments, for Remember education, Martin, and for sex. infrastructure investments. That's their priority, Mr. Speaker. They're doing a good job. And we'll uh, right after I asked the member to come to order, he just kept yelling. So I'm going to say second time to the member of Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. Just uh, wrap up, please. Are you finished? Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you. So, Speaker, I can take from the fact we didn't get an answer about the 250 stores is that they're selling 250 stores across Ontario. That's plain and simple, Speaker. And it's curious that the RFP went out before the budget was released, yet none of those details were in the budget. Yeah. No details on which 250 locations, no details on how many of the thousands of jobs will be cut, no details on the financial impact this will have on the bottom line. Speaker, I wonder, is this more Liberal furniture burning to heat the home? Is this another part of the Liberal plan to balance their budget? I asked the minister, why were you keeping details of this sale of LCBO stores secret from the people of Ontario? Thank you. Well, I think you're getting close. <coughs> Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, there's no Remember secret. Remember from Renfrew, second time. There's no secret that this side of the House supports the LCBO, supports the work that they're doing, and, Mr. Speaker, we are continuing to provide all the supports necessary for the LCBO to succeed. It is why they are the wholesalers of the distribution that's being advanced to grocery chains, for, for example, Mr. Speaker. The member opposite makes reference to secrecy. Well, there may be some market sensitivities and commercial sensitivities. This I can say, though. LCBO stores and the distribution network will continue with the same complement that it has now because it benefits all of Ontarians. What may occur in respect to being a lease premise or an own premise, that will be up to the LCBO determining the best value for taxpayer money, Mr. Speaker, and the best value for our returns. The member opposite as finance critics should know better. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. No question. The member from London, Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Speaker, students and families in London are contacting my office concerned about the possible closure of the Robart School for the Deaf and the Amethyst School in London. Families wonder why the minister has cut off enrollment into provincial and demonstration schools if she's really only just consulting. They wonder why this government capped enrollment at 42 when the program has space for 138 students. Children in London have been waiting and hoping for months only to learn that they may never get these specialized services in the schools. The closure of both schools leaves students in southwestern Ontario with nowhere else to turn. Speaker. Why is the minister trying to balance Question. the budget on the backs of some of our most vulnerable students? Thank you. Mr. Education. 
Yes, thank you very much. And uh, I, wa I want to uh, start out by assuring everyone that at the moment we are consulting on the future of the programs to make sure that we actually serve deaf children in Ontario and children with very severe learning needs in the best way possible. No decisions have been made. I want to emphasize that. While, while we're doing the consultation, we have put a pause on accepting enrollments because we need to figure out what is the best way to deliver the programs going forward. And certainly, as I've, as I've been visiting, as I've been visiting the uh, schools, uh, the demonstration schools, which deal with uh, children with very severe learning disabilities, the uh, demonstration schools have some wonderful Answer. programs. And the problem is, though, that we have uh, we have thousands of kids in the province Thank who you. need support with reading. Supplementary. Speaker, parents are concerned. They're concerned and they're contacting my office and they want us to be the voice so that this minister will listen. Speaker, back to the minister. Students who want to attend specialized schools like Robarts or Amethyst should have the right to do so. These are some of the most vulnerable kids in our province. They deserve better. Their families deserve better. Thousands of parents have signed petitions online begging the minister and her government to keep these important schools open. This weekend, we heard from Becca Haggett, a student who attends Amethyst and has benefited deeply from it. She is advocating for herself and for the rights of other children with unique needs that need to access these schools. The minister needs to listen to students who are directly impacted by these specialized programs. Speaker, will Question. the minister guarantee today neither Amethyst Amethyst, no Robarts will be closed because of consultations, yes or no. Thank you. Minister, yes, and, and if I could, uh, if I could just talk a little bit about the Amethyst School, which uh, just to uh, clarify, uh, speaker, for children with severe learning disabilities, uh, many of the children who are at Amethyst are uh, six or even eight grade levels behind in terms of their reading uh, acquisition, their reading skills. They're kids who are intelligent kids, uh, but they just haven't been able to learn to read. We know that the kids who are at Amethyst are not the only kids in the province who are struggling with learning to read. We know that there are other kids in the province uh, who haven't had the opportunity to go to Amethyst who are struggling to learn to read. We need to figure out how do we help all the kids who are Answer. struggling to learn to read but have average intelligence. There's a bigger group, and we need to think through our programs carefully. Thank you. New question, the member from Ottawa South. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for Minister of Natural Resources and Forests. The 2017 budget contained many positive measures to grow our economy for Ontarians. Among them was continued support for your Ministry of Natural Resources. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry oversees industries that Ontarians rely on every day, industries like aggregates and wood products that build our schools, our hospitals and homes, and that thousands of, uh, of Ontarians rely on for jobs. The Ministry also works to protect the public, its plants and its wildlife while providing opportunities to experience our natural heritage. Can the Minister share how this government's budget is supporting the activities of the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry? Thank you. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much, and I want to thank uh, the member for the question. Speaker, as, as most people will know, certainly uh, most people in Northern Ontario will know, the forest industry really felt the downturn of the recession two or three years before the 08 recession really took hold in the rest of the province. Speaker, and as a result of that, our government came forward with a broad suite of programs, many of which are still in existence, valued at well over a billion dollars, wow. which continue and have supported the forestry industry in Ontario. Currently, Speaker, we're working very hard representing the interests of our industry on the international stage, 
As many will know, the softwood lumber agreement is currently being renegotiated. We're doing our best to represent the Ontario industry in that regard. We still have a very significant roads funding program in place to support the industry. And as well, Speaker, I would add we have created a new program uh, that supports the forest industry here Answer. in Ontario, the Forestry Growth Fund, a new program under the Jobs and uh, Growth Fund, the Jobs and Prosperity Fund, which will help forestry Thank on you. a go-forward basis with their capital projects. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'd uh, like to thank the minister for his response. Uh, minister, there is, has been some confusion in the media recently with regards to service and license fees within the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. So I know that service fees collected by your ministry support activities valuable to many Ontarians. Amongst the most visible and impactful are Ontario's parks. Mr. Speaker, can the minister correct the record in this legislature around the fees and the activities that such fees support? Thank you. Minister. Yeah, again, I want to thank the member for the question and the opportunity to correct the record again. I've done this at least once before, Speaker, and further about the things that such fees and the broader budget do support. First and foremost, recreational fish and wildlife licenses are not going up as part of Budget 2016. Further, existing fees are used exclusively to support the management of fish and wildlife for today and tomorrow, Speaker. There's a planned increase of about 50 cents per car per night for visitors to Ontario parks. These fees, as well as seasonal lot fees, contribute to Ontario parks' ability to be more than 85 percent self-funded. Speaker, I think that's important to remember. More than that, the budget also contains new money for important parks infrastructure that will enhance the experience of visitors to Ontario parks. Ontario parks, like in the members uh, riding or near his territory, uh, Redo River and Fitzroy near the members riding, are among my ministry's best contributions to the province and provincial parks piece. Speaker, this budget's investments in parks, along with a balanced approach to service fees, ensure that parks operations are sustainable yes, for sir. future generations. I want to Thank you. Your question, the member from Melbourne, Middlesex, London. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister, the government's rationing of health care has created a crisis in Ontario. Last week in London, 22 mental health patients were left waiting for beds. They were placed in a classroom because there was no space. Guelph's emergency room was shut down when 11 mental health patients required inpatient admission, but the hospital had nowhere to place them. Minister, mental health patients deserve the same care as physical health patients. Why are you failing our mentally ill across this province by failing to deal with the crisis in our health care system today? Minister, will you stand up and stop rationing the health care system? Thank you. Mr. Hill, long term care. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm not exactly sure how a $1 billion new investment in our health care system can be described as anything at all in relationship to what the member opposite yeah, is alleging. Very good news. And I think he was in the legislature last week when we talked about uh, the situation in London where I reminded uh, the members of the legislature of the new investment of more than $1 million uh, included on capital as well as an operating uh, uh, um, budget as well to develop a brand new crisis centre for That's mental fantastic. health. Uh, patients moment. in London and in the Middlesex area. Mr. Speaker, we're continuing to make these important investments. I would hope that the member again acknowledge that often it is in the community with strong community support Answer. where the best outcomes are achieved. It's not necessarily in the hospital. Yep. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, back to the minister. Minister, I was here last week when your government turned your back on everybody suffering from rare diseases. Yeah. Minister, yeah. Speaker, the situation worsened over the weekend. Pete Verburn, who suffers from Alzheimer's, spent eight nights sleeping on the Victoria Hospital floor while in restraints because there are no beds enough or enough frontline health care professionals to look after him. Your government has had many photo ops promoting mental health support, but the government is failing terribly. The health care system is being rationed because of your government's financial mismanagement. Over $2 billion have been wasted on e-health. $26.9 million on the diabetes registry, and billions more on orange. Could you only think of the mental health services we could have in our province if you hadn't wasted that money? Minister, will you stop the waste in rationing and look after our most vulnerable that are slipping through the cracks of your mismanaged health care system? Well, Mr. Speaker, the uh, billion-dollar increase to our health care system 
uh, includes uh, many important investments, whether they be in palliative care and hospice care, whether they be in mental health, an additional uh, multi-million dollar investment in mental health services in this province, whether they be the capital investments of $12 billion over the next 10 years. But, Mr. Speaker, we've had an independent study by ISIS, which has shown that the reforms that we're making are having a positive impact. A shorter length of stay in hospital, increased numbers of patients treated, minimal impact on readmission rates, and importantly, a statistically significant reduction in nurse-sensitive adverse events. That's important because that's about the safety of our frontline health care workers, and the evidence shows that our reforms, our transformation, our quality agenda over the past few years is making an important and positive impact. Yep. Thank you. Further questions? The member from Hamilton East, Stony Creek. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health and Long-Term Care. Liberal cuts to health care are hurting patients in Hamilton, Minister. Hamilton Health Sciences is cutting nearly 100 full-time positions. St. Joe's is cutting 136 positions, and mental health services are being moved out of my riding and out of East Hamilton. Those services are a lifeline for people in need, but now the whole east side of Hamilton will be without psychiatric care. Patients will be asked to take the bus for an extra hour each way to the remaining facility on Mohawk, uh, on Mohawk and Hamilton Mountain. And these additional burdens of time and money will only discourage patients from getting the help they need. Will the minister explain to us why this government is making it harder for people in East Hamilton to get the mental health care they require? Thank you. Minister for Health, Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, uh, I first want to address the allegations, uh, the comments made at the beginning of the member's question with regards to Hamilton Health Sciences generally. We do know that they reviewed uh, 230 different options for finding efficiencies and for staying within their allocation. Uh, they decided on a number of those options, of more than 200. They decided on a handful of them. Uh, it does result in some job losses, uh, approximately 90, but almost 50 of those are unfilled positions, so the true number is closer to four, between 40 and 50, Mr. Speaker. The Ontario Nurses Association says, quote, only a very small number, unquote, of the effective jobs at HHS are in nursing, Mr. Speaker. There are non-union positions which are being uh, removed as a result of this change. It's an important, I think, I think we need to recognize, Mr. Speaker, we yes, need sir. to give the tools to our hospitals to make the changes they deem necessary to provide the best quality patient care. Mr. Right. Interesting. Speaker, RNs, RPNs, social workers, child care workers, technologists and lab staff and many other workers are all threatened by cuts at St. Joseph's and they know the impact this will have on their community. The closure of the East Region Mental Health Services is a body blow to my riding, which is the second poorest in Ontario. Minister, poverty breeds poor health, including mental health. This clinic exists to provide community-based support. Instead, we're asking people to travel an hour each way out of their community to get help. Gary Birch from Bimbrook contacted my office and pointed out that these patients have reached a mental or financial state such that they can only access a mental health service that is near them. They will not venture very afar. Yet this government is telling them to hit the road. This pattern of short-term cuts with long-term costs and consequences is the hallmark Question. of this Liberal government, and it is occurring across our province. How long will patients in Hamilton have to suffer just because the Liberal government can't get its priorities thank straight? You. <laughs> Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My understanding is that this is one of the uh, changes that St. Joseph's is contemplating uh, to its mental health system. Of course, we know on the mountain there is a more than $1 billion investment in the mental health services uh, that provides support to people not just from Hamilton but for the entire uh, region, Mr. Speaker. And, and we need to also acknowledge the importance of moving those uh, programs and services and supports out into the community, and we've been doing that through a investment of $20 million over six years in the Medical Psychiatry Alliance, yes. which is going to provide tens of thousands of individuals better access to mental health services or I'm surprised that the member doesn't talk about the mobile crisis rapid rep yes. response team that's set up in Hamilton, which yes. has ride-alongs of mental health workers with our police officers, so that if there is a mental health uh, crisis uh, involving somebody Answer. who otherwise would end up in the, in the justice system, they get involved. They often divert away from hospitals to begin with to provide the important community supports that also keep that person out of prison. Yeah. Good question. The member from Newmarket Aurora. 
Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Children and Youth Services. This budget made significant investments to help children and youth across the province. Many families in my riding of Newmarket Aurora are glad to hear that we will be providing $333 million in new funding for autism services. Mr. Speaker, I think often of the parents and children with uh, autism who come to see me and the challenges and struggles they face each day. Uh, I am sure they'll support this government's additional investments for children and youth with special needs. Can the minister please inform the House of the important investments her ministry is making to support Ontario's children? Thank you, Minister of Children and Youth Services. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Newmarket Aurora for this very excellent question. He's absolutely right. The new investments uh, that have been mentioned are very, very good news for children, youth, and families in Ontario. This year's budget, Speaker, it increases the children and youth budget by 2.1 percent. This is very, very good news for families across the province. And as mentioned, we're investing $330 million in new funds to support children and youth with autism. We've worked really hard with the expert speaker to develop a plan for new funding, and we'll be announcing those details shortly. We've also invested an additional $17.8 million for children with special needs, which is nearly, which is just part of the nearly half a billion dollars we provide to support children with special Answer. needs and their families across the province. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the minister for her answer. These investments will certainly make a difference in the lives of my constituents, particularly those caring for children with special <laughs> needs or autism. And the overall increase for the budget of her ministry of 2.1 per cent is impressive and certainly money well spent. I'm happy that I'll be able to report this good news to my community. I also imagine that uh, these new initiatives, uh, these new investments are being well received more broadly. Can the minister please explain how people are responding to the initiatives she's just mentioned? Thank you, Minister. So I want to thank the member again for the question. He's absolutely right. Um, I'm very pleased to report that our investments in children and youth are being uh, well received and supported by stakeholders in the sector. For example, uh, Margaret Spoolstra, the executive director of Autism Ontario, said families raising children with autism have been waiting a very long time for this announcement. This investment will set the stage for continuous learning for years to come. Yet, Speaker, the leader of the official opposition called our investments, so I called them appropriate and well-received, and he also recognized that the $17.8 million for special needs is a step in the right direction, and the NDP member for Kitchener-Waterloo called these investments for autism a positive step. Despite all Answer. that, Speaker, I'm very disappointed that we've heard that both opposition parties have indicated they will not be supporting our budget and therefore will not be supporting Thank these you. very important Yay. initiatives. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Speaker, whenever it is time for the Prospectors and Developers Annual Conference, this government always seems to rediscover the mining sector. Yeah, that's right. that's but this year in the budget, the only significant mention of the $60 billion Ring of Fire project was a re-announcement from 2014. Wow. The same page in the budget has essentially been copied and pasted for three years. This wouldn't be so disappointing except for the fact not a single dollar of these promised infrastructure funds has been used to advance the project. Speaker, will the minister explain his government's total lack of urgency on developing the Ring of Fire? Thank you, Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you very much for the question, and, and, and the member knows well what a priority, uh, not just the Ring of Fire, but the entire mineral development sector is, and that's why the Prospectors and Developers Association Conference is such an important gathering. Yes, indeed, we are very proud of our continued $1 billion commitment towards the Ring of Fire, and we're going to continue our discussions, certainly with the federal government, here, here. with the First Nations, and with industry as we move forward. There are important discussions going on that the member knows well about that are going to lead us forward, and they're going to also lead us to 
are other mineral development prospects that we are very, very excited about. The fact that we also have $120 million that is committed to the Northern Industrial Electricity Rate Program is also crucial. The fact that we have a record-breaking investment in infrastructure development is also crucial for the mining sector. So while we see uh, a continued challenge in the mining sector, if the member was down at PDAC yesterday, Chair. he'll recognize that indeed there's a very positive atmosphere yes, for future development in the mining sector. Again, to the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Speaker, the Minister continues to insist that progress is being made. But where's the proof? He just admitted that not a nickel is blown. In fact, over the past three years alone, you've missed your own government deadlines in every measurable area of the project. The Auditor General used her 2015 report to single out your ministry for its ineffectiveness and inaction. Speaker, continued talk by this government won't develop the ring of fire. If that were the case, we'd already have the 5,500 jobs per year that the Ontario Chamber of Commerce estimates will be created by the project. Mr. Speaker, why can't this government get anything right, especially on a project as important as the Ring of Fire? Mike wasn't on. Finish, please. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As the member knows, well, well, we're doing very, very important work with the Matawa First Nations. We've got to put a regional framework agreement in place and allows us to move forward with important discussions. The fact is, we need to have the communities embracing this development. This is an extraordinary resource development project in a remote part of the province that has never seen development before. So there are many considerations at play. But what we have is positive development moving forward in terms of that regional framework agreement, in including discussions about regional infrastructure development, about resource revenue sharing, about socio-economic supports, and that's a game why we are so encouraged by our, our relationship with the, with the new federal government. I had an opportunity to, to see a number of ministries yesterday, a number of federal members, and there is great eagerness to continue those discussions. We are going to move forward in this project, as we are in so many projects Answer. in terms of the mining sector. We're excited about it. We're going to stay positive. We sure wish you would as well, because at the end of the day, we are going to see a great development in Northern Ontario. Thank you. Stop, stop. You see it? New question, member from London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Attorney General. Speaker, tomorrow is International Women's Day, but in Ontario, instead of moving forward, women have been made more vulnerable by the Liberal government's decision to cut funding to partner assault response. If this government was serious about ending domestic violence, it would recognize the need to hold abusive partners responsible for changing their violent behaviours. Last week, a provincial survey revealed that almost half of Ontario men believe that victims are to blame if they stay in an abusive relationship. Does the Liberal government support this view? And if not, why is the Attorney General cutting funding for PAR, the only government program for men who abuse? Thank you. Attorney General. Mr. Speaker. Uh, this program, PAR, is a very uh, important component of our government's plan to end violence against women. And I wanted to say to the public that the, this government has increased money into this program. In 2014 and 15, more than 11,000 offenders were referred to this program. We are committed to collaborating with stakeholders on ways to further improve PAR. I have listened to stakeholder concerns about the program, and some service providers are concerned with declines in referral rates and the data the government relies on to determine funding allocation. So my ministry took these concerns into consideration and has adjusted funding yes, allocation sir. for 1617 in order to minimize the impact on agencies. So uh, we, we have not reduced the Thank you. Supplementary. 
Uh, thank you, Speaker. The minister knows that overall PAR funding has been cut as much as 50 per cent for the Windsor PAR program, 25 per cent in Elgin. These cuts came after the Premier stood in this House on December 2 and declared there are no cuts to PAR. Why did the minister ignore the calls of violence against women experts and frontline agencies to halt any further changes to PAR? Why did she ignore the Premier, who said there would be no changes to PAR allocations and instead cut the 2016 allocations for PAR provider agencies? Thank you. Attorney General. So, Mrs. Mr. Speaker, our government's annual investment in the PAR program has increased by 47 per cent from 7.2 million in 2004 5 to 10.6 million. Wow in 2015 and 16. So there is a concern about the, the, uh, this program. We've listened to the concern, and we will be convening a stakeholder meeting on April 20, 2016, with all of our power providers, violence against women stakeholders, and experts to discuss concern about the program and also hear their ideas for improvement. We always wanted to improve the eff efficiency of the program, yes, and we will continue to uh, listen to the stakeholders. Very Thank you, Mr. Good. Speaker. No question. The member from Brampton Springdale. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My, uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Associate Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister, as we all know, the number of Ontario seniors aged 65 and over is projected to more than double to over 4.5 million, or 25 per cent of the population by 2041. And with that growth, we know that increasing number of our parents and grandparents may one day require specialized care provided by one of the province's long-term care facilities. Mr. Speaker, we also know that this demand for long-term care in increases. Organizations like the Ontario Long-Term Care Association are telling us the number of long-term care residents coming into care with cognitive apartments impart have increased significantly, with more than 60 per cent of the residents in our long-term care homes currently having Alzheimer's or some other form of dementia. And as more and more families in my riding are turning their thoughts towards care of their parents and grandparents in the future, I would like to reassure them Question. that their loved ones will continue the highest level of care. So, Minister, can you please tell this House how about the new funding and how they will how it will be used to provide the highest level of care Thank for you. loved ones? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and let me begin by thanking the member from uh, Brampton-Springdale for this important question and her ongoing advocacy for seniors in her riding. Mr. Speaker, the member is absolutely right. Over the last decade, we have seen an increase in the instances of people with dementia entering long-term care, exhibiting what are called responsive behaviors, such as aggression, wandering, and agitation. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, long-term care is one of the areas that the Ministry of Health has consistently been increasing funding, Mr. Speaker, and this year is no exception. In fact, Mr. Speaker, this year we are providing exceptional funding to the long-term care sector, including a 2 percent increase across the board to every single long-term care home in Ontario for their personal care needs, for their personal care needs of residents. But more importantly, Mr. Speaker, we are also yes, increasing our investment in Behavioural Supports Ontario by $10 million. And I have to say this, Mr. Speaker, if the opposition Thank is you. really serious about— No, you don't. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, that's wonderful news. The residents of my riding, I'm sure, will be happy to know how important a priority the safety of our loved ones is for you and for your ministry. But, Minister, I know you're responsible for the wellness of Ontarians, and I know that making Ontario smoke-free is a goal that you're quite passionate about. I know smoking prevalence has decreased from 24.5% in 2000 to 17.4% in 2014, representing 408,000 fewer smokers. And as a member of this government, I'm proud to say that Ontario has the third lowest smoking rate in the country. But, Mr. Speaker, the use of tobacco products remains the leading cause of prevent preventable disease and death in Ontario. More than two million Ontarians still smoke, and thousands of youth still take up smoking every year. So, through you, Mr. Speaker, can the minister tell this House what our government announced in the budget last week to help us continue striving towards the goal of Ontario achieving the Question. lowest smoking rate in the country? Thank you, Minister. 
Thank you, Speaker. And again, I want to thank the member for the question. And as the minister responsible for health and wellness in Ontario, I'm very proud to continue the legacy of protecting Ontarians, especially young Ontarians, from the harmful effects of tobacco. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, I am so pleased to announce to this House that we're going to increase funding for smoking cessation by $5 million if this budget is passed. So, Mr. Speaker, whether it's long-term care, whether it's health promotion, this government is increasing funding. And this is what I have to say to the opposition, Mr. Speaker. If they are really serious about supporting our seniors, instead of asking sanctimonious questions in this House, I would ask that they stand up and support this budget. Because, here, here. Mr. Speaker, talk is cheap, but they have the opportunity to really support seniors by standing up for this budget. Here, here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. New question. The member from Kitchener, uh, Kitchener Conestoga. Thank you. Uh, my question is to the uh, Minister of uh, Transportation. Minister, why are you allowing Metrolinx to give away millions of taxpayers' dollars in grants? Thank you, Minister of Transportation. Uh, thanks very much, Speaker. I uh, thank the member, as I always do, for the question. I. Uh, it was unfortunate I didn't hear the last part of the question, Speaker. I understand it was about Metrolinx <clears throat> and the, uh, the tremendous work that Metrolinx is doing uh, right now to make sure that we continue to build the province up, continue to invest in transit, Speaker. Uh, there, are a long, there is a long list of items, Speaker, since 2003 uh, that the team at Metrolinx and Go Transit have worked very hard on, Speaker. For example, since 2003, uh, we have built 14 new stations. We have rebuilt four existing GO stations. We have extended our rail network, Speaker, by more than 90 kilometers since 2003. We've added more than 31,000 parking spots across the network, Speaker. We've added over 200 new rail cars, over 150 new single-level buses, and over 250 double-decker buses, uh, Speaker, will be added over the next five years. This will support communities right across the greater Answer. Toronto and Hamilton area, including Kitchener-Waterloo, Speaker. Speaker, it was only recently when Metrolinx was wrapped up in a scandal when it made public uh, that they were using taxpayer dollars to sponsor TIFF, Buffalo Bills game in Toronto, in a deal where ta staff were given free tickets. Today we've learned that Metrolinx has operated outside their mandate once again by giving away millions of dollars in grants of oh, taxpayers' no. money. Scandal after scandal, and you still haven't learned your lesson. Up Express has empty trains. There are sheds too small for their electric trains at Union Station. And now we have this slush fund. Metrolinx's sole job should be to plan, build, and manage transit. And it's the minister's job to provide the necessary oversight and transparency. Here, here. Speaker, how much more taxpayer money do we have to watch Metrolinx toss away before they finally do something Question. about it? Thank you. Minister. Thanks very much, Speaker. I mean, from, from my perspective, I, uh, I appreciate again the member's follow-up question. I, I understand that there was a, there were changes that were made by my predecessor uh, more than a couple of years ago, Speaker, with respect to some of the uh, some of the concerns the member opposite is raising, Speaker. But with respect to Metrolinx not only having that clear mandate, but also, frankly, Speaker, delivering on that mandate. A couple of other items I didn't mention earlier. For example, Speaker, other recent investments include 14 new weekday train trips added on the Kitchener Go corridor between Mount Pleasant Go Station and Union Station during off-peak midday hours. New and enhanced Go bus service that's been added in the Milton, Highway 407, Barry, Lakeshore, and Stouffville corridor. Speaker, the opening of the West Harbour Go Station last June, Speaker, in time for the Pan Am Para Pan Am Games, announcing the extension of Go Transit service on the Lakeshore West Go line to a new GO station at Centennial Parkway and Stony Creek, Speaker, and the list goes on and on. This is a government and this is a premier that are committed to building the province up, Speaker, and I would expect that member to support our Thank you. Uh, just a comment for those that uh, continue to seek from the Speaker uh, advice on whether or not an answer is satisfactory. I don't have the authority, but I'm going to make it clear to you that I will deal with people that are not dealing with policy. After that, it's up to them to decide how to answer that questions, their questions. So just remember that. New question, the member from Nickel Belt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question, pour le... My question is for the Minister of Environment. Speaking today marks a really, really sad day. It is the first anniversary of the train derailment, the explosion and the oil spill in Gogama in my riding. The residents woke up at about 3 a.m. the mo morning of March 7 to a wall of flame 
that turned the sky orange and the smell of burning oil. But Ontario Ministry of Environment and Climate Change have been extremely quiet. Quiet while the people of Gogama are seeing their real estate price tank. And they are concerned about their environment, their food and the water quality. The situation is bleak, Speaker. This is the biggest train derailment in the history of Ontario, yet no amount of trouble suffering seems to trigger a response from this government. Question. People of Gogama want to know, when will the minister commit to standing up for them and answer a simple question? Are the fish caught in the Mackamie River safe to Thank eat? You. Yes or no? Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And we are very, very concerned about the folks in Gogama who have now uh, seen not one but two train derailments uh, with CN. Uh, this is a standard of safety we do not think is acceptable, and I and the Minister of Transportation have raised this issue with the government responsible uh, in Canada. That's the federal government. Uh, as the member knows, and I appreciate her leadership and her work on this and her, the sincerity of her question, uh, we have been trying to get the federal government to do its job in this area. And uh, Under the previous government, we got very little progress, Mr. Speaker. My ministry has done something it hasn't done before, which has now taken the uh, fish and has been testing them themselves. Uh, this is not normally what we do in our labs. That's not a provincial responsibility, uh, but we got so fed up and so frustrated with an action that we took those actions. And Sir. I'm hoping that my parliamentary, uh, my legislative assistant is hearing me and will rush over those results Thank before you. the end of the question period for me. Thank you. Thank you. The yeah, member from Simple uh, Gray on a point of order. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, uh, point of order. Uh, during question period today, in response to uh, our leader Patrick Brown, the uh, Minister of the Environment claimed that the uh, PC uh, climate change policy would cost an additional $160 a ton. Would the minister? Thank you. Thank you. First, uh, first, that is not a point of order. Uh, I'm trying to uh, rule here, please. Uh, first, that's not a point of order, and second, uh, any member has uh, at any time the ability, not quite any time if it's question period, to correct their own record, uh, and I thank you for that. I, uh, excuse me. Excuse me. Okay. Um, I do have. I'm going to take a moment to uh, re-engage uh, the, the House uh, along with uh, my uh, deputy speakers. Uh, we've had this discussion, and I want to redirect uh, the idea that you're speaking to the chair. Uh, please, if you need some lessons or if you need some guidance, the table is always uh, willing to do that. Uh, it does not help the. I'd like to finish. It does not help the debate uh, by moving into finger pointing at individuals, telling them what they have to do. Uh, it actually escalates things. So if you're going to help uh, in this place, direct your questions and comments to the chair. The deputies have been advised and they're going to be uh, uh, working on that. If you need some help, the table has uh, uh, indicated that sometimes it's very difficult to speak in the third person. So do so by speaking in the first person to the chair and design your questions and answers around that. Please, there are no deferred votes. This House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.